Hello, I'm Jeff Trander, and in this video I'm going to present a classic Heathkit radio receiver, the HR-10B. I'll tell you a bit about the history of the radio and its features. We'll look at the radio inside and out, and have a short on-air demo. We'll finish up with a discussion of the strengths and weaknesses. The HR-10B is a 5-band AM CW single sideband amateur radio receiver sold by the Heathkit Company. Introduced in 1967 and on the market through 1975, it sold new for about 75 US dollars. In today's dollars, this would be about 300 to 450 dollars. Like most Heath kits, it was sold only as a kit, which you needed to assemble. This is an amateur radio receiver covering the five classic HF bands, 80, 40, 20, 15, and 10 meters. As such, it's really only useful for receiving amateur radio signals and not general short wave listening. I bought this radio used in 1976 for 90 Canadian dollars, which at the time was a lot of money for a 15-year-old who worked part-time making about three to four dollars per hour. I used this radio as I was studying for my ham radio license and later paired it up with a DX60B transmitter and HG10B VFO to complete my first amateur radio station. The notable features of the radio include coverage of the five classic HF ham bands, use of seven miniature tubes, no transistors or integrated circuits here. A crystal lattice filter with fixed 3 kilohertz bandwidth. A 1681 kilohertz IF frequency. Switchable BFO for receiving CW, Morse code, and single sideband signals. An automatic noise limiter. Audio and RF gain controls. An S meter. And a connector for a TR switch. This switches the antenna and puts the receiver in standby during transmit. It's in a solid metal chassis and weighs about 20 pounds or 9 kilos. Let's take a look at the front panel. On the front panel, starting from the left, we have the headphone jack, which cuts out the external speaker when a headphone is inserted, the power and audio frequency gain or volume control, RF or radio frequency gain control, BFO tuning, and five position band switch. Switches here for turning on and off the automatic noise limiter, the automatic volume control, and the BFO. We have the main tuning knob and dials for antenna trim and adjusting the optional crystal calibrator, which I'll cover momentarily. Also switches for the crystal calibrator and switching the receiver between receive mode and standby. Here we have the large slide rule dial with the five bands indicated and to the left an S meter. Now let's take a look at the rear panel. On the rear panel we've got the connection to an external 8 ohm speaker. There's no internal speaker built in. Uh, jack or plug connector for the optional transmit receive switch and if you're not using one then you need the shorting plug to keep the receiver in receive mode. A zero adjustment for the S meter and a phono connector for the antenna jack. A popular modification was to put a uh, UHF style connector on the antenna jack in place of the uh, RCA phono jack. I also have the HRA101 crystal calibrator. This was an optional add-on. It calibrates the dial by generating signals at multiples of 100 kHz. You move the cal reset knob to adjust the pointer to that frequency. Mine didn't originally have one and I bought it years later in 2006 on eBay. It didn't work initially, and I found there was a wiring error in the radio that must have been there since it was assembled. Let's have a listen to some uh, on-air signals. I turned the radio on a few minutes ago and let it warm up. So I'll just take it out of standby mode. First, let's uh, adjust the uh, frequency using the crystal calibrator. What we could do here is set the dial. In this case, we're on 40 meters. So let's set it to the nearest 100 kilohertz setting to where we're going to operate, so let's say 7.1 megahertz. We turn on the calibrator, we'll hear the, uh, the tone, and we can adjust the cal reset for a zero beat. And we should be right on 7.1 kilohertz now. It's actually necessary to calibrate it as you switch bands or even uh, move a large distance within a band um, due to the inaccuracy of the, the receiver of these, of these vintage. Let's see if we can pick up any CW signals tonight on the 40 meter band. So we're picking 
hooking up some Morse code or CW signals, uh, also hearing some radio teletype. If we went out to the higher end of the 40 meter band, we would hear some single sideband signals as well. So as you see, I'm using an external speaker. There was no matching speaker. I'm using a uh, Radio Shack speaker uh, that I purchased that came with a, a case. Uh, and that works well. Often people will use headphones, particularly for receiving Morse code signals. So that's our little on-air demo. This was a popular radio in its time. Overall, what are the strengths of this radio? It's easy to operate. It's good looking, solidly built, and has an easy to read dial. It's easy to repair, align, and troubleshoot. Most parts are still obtainable. And it works with the matching DX60B transmitter and HG1 VFO. What are its weaknesses? Well, obviously, it doesn't have the features of modern solid state microprocessor controlled rigs. It had no built in speaker or even a matching speaker. There's no break-in capability, although you can switch between transmit and receive with one switch if you have a TR switch. It's not very sensitive, especially in the higher bands. The sensitivity is claimed to be one microvolt, though I doubt it meets that on the higher bands. The S meter is only useful when the ABC is enabled and the RF gain is at maximum, so it's typically only useful for AM signals. It also has a fixed 3 kilohertz bandwidth with no uh, narrow filters suitable for CW or most Morse code receiving, for example. The noise limiter isn't particularly useful. And it doesn't support the newer ham bands, such as the uh, WARC bands introduced in 1979 and some of the later bands. And like ma most vacuum tube equipment, it takes about 30 minutes to fully warm up and stop drifting, although drift was minimal in typical equipment of this era. These radios are still obtainable today on eBay and at ham radio flea markets. For any equipment like this, if you're buying it used, uh, I have suggestions for a th few things to watch for and to watch out for. First, uh, see if the radio comes with the original manual. Uh, it's always good to have the original manual, although copies are available for most Heathkit manuals on the internet, but uh, it's nice to have the original assembly and operating manual. Watch for modifications that might have been made to the radio over the years. And watch for poorly constructed kits, particularly the workmanship of the soldering. And finally, if the radio is missing some hard to replace parts like band switches, coils, or some of the unique mechanical parts, that can be problematic as well. The HR10B was actually a re replacement of an older model HR10. The only difference between the two was that the paint was changed from a smooth to a wrinkle finish to match the DX60B transmitter. Electrically, they're the same. Some of the information on the radio came from Chuck Penson's book, Heathkit, A Guide to Amateur Radio Products. If you're a fan of Heathkit equipment, I'm sure you'll find this book fascinating. Watch for future videos that will cover the matching DX60B transmitter and HG1B VFO. I hope you enjoyed this little video as much as I enjoyed making it.